Hello and welcome to Book Passage Live. Today we are here to talk about Easy Crafts for the Insane, a mostly funny memoir of mental illness and making things by Kelly Williams Brown. Uh, Kelly Williams is a, the New York Times bestselling author of Adulting and Gracious. She's a former reporter, ad copywriter, Bourbon Street bartender, and she lives with her giant neurotic dog, Eleanor, in Salem, Oregon. In conversation today with her is Brooke Jackson Glidden, who is an award-winning editor and journalist based in Portland, Oregon. She currently serves as the editor of Eater Portland. Her work has appeared in the Boston Globe, the Arizona Republic, and USA Today, as well as Eater's national website. She also happened to be the first editor of Easy Crafts for the Insane and has lived with Kelly Williams Brown for two blissful years. Thank you both so much for being here today. And I wanna let everyone in the audience know that if they have any questions for either of them, they can ask them in the chat on YouTube and I will relay them to the uh, authors. And if you have any um, questions, please feel free to do it because you know we wanna have this be an engaging and, and lively discussion with everyone. So thank you both so much for being here and please feel free to take it away. So this is such a wild thing to be talking about this book with you, Kelly, um, because our friendship really started right at the beginning of this when this book begins, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I've sort of been your friend and in your life through that entire period to where we are now. So I'm wondering when in that period did you start to think, okay, this really miserable 700 day period might be an interesting book or a powerful book? Well, first off, um, thank you so much for that great question. Brooke, thank you so much for doing this with me um, and being my friend and having also, as Zach said, uh, done the first edit of this book. And I'll talk a little bit about our relationship in a moment. And thank you so much to Zach and Book Passage for having us. It's really exciting to be here. Um, so basically, like you said, the book is my 700 really bad days. And the inciting incident is not the beginning of our friendship, but is in fact my divorce. And then it um, it sort of goes downhill from there. And the book covers this really bad span of time during which um, among other things, I am so sorry, I live right across the street from a park and the chainsaw just started. And I don't know if everyone can hear that. And if you can, I'm extremely sorry. Um, and Zach, please let me know if the audio gets too bad. Um, so anyway, so it started with my divorce and then I broke three of my four limbs in separate unrelated incidents. My depression medication stopped working. I fell into a deep depression um, and, and lots of other things that are outlined in that book. And they, all these things, again, happened in the space of this, this small period. And so at a certain point, it began to feel like I had really been cursed by a witch. Um, and I am not someone who traditionally writes about myself. I'm a reporter. I My previous books have been advice. And I had not really thought, ever thought like I should write a memoir. I have a story worth telling. Um, and I think it really wasn't until sort of the end of the book, or maybe even when I was in the psychiatric hospital that I thought, well, this is quite the story. This is a series of terrible events. And you know, it's funny because in the past, I've sort of like really had a good idea of like the book that I want to write. And then I fail to whatever extent to actually write the book that I envision. But in this case, I really didn't know what exactly I wanted the book to be, only that I felt this strange compulsion to tell this story, which is not, like I said, an experience that I've generally had in my life and my writing before. So a great long-winded answer is, I don't really know. Um, I don't know the when, but I definitely knew that this was maybe a story worth sharing, not because it's so rare or unique, but just that these are such common human experiences. And I think being able to talk about them and see what's funny about them and maybe make some art out of them would be a cool thing to do. Absolutely. Um, and it's, you know, you mentioned specifically that most of your past writing has been from this perspective as a reporter, even in your previous books, you sort of approach these questions of what it means to be gracious, what it means to be an adult, sort of as a reporter asking experts for their, you know, general advice or guidance. So with that sort of glut of reporting experience, how did you apply that to the process of writing a memoir and telling your own story? Well, it's, it's really interesting because as a reporter, you are so incredibly strict 
with quoting something precisely exactly as it happened. Like you can edit out a huh, you know, or something like that. But, but the idea is that anything in your reporting, had someone been there listening to it, it would have been exactly the same way. Um, with memoir, you try very, very hard to do that. And I certainly talk to people, including you, including other people in the story, although not specifically three of the main characters, which we can talk about in a little bit. But it the importance of telling the truth, as I understood it, was always so foremost in my mind that when I first turned in a draft, uh, not to you, but to uh, my acquiring and wonderful editor, uh, Michelle Howery at Penguin Random House, she was like, okay, this is great, but this is, you have basically created a TikTok of these 18 months where it was like, and then this happened, and then this happened, but then at this point, this happened, which caused that to happen. And she's like, but you don't really talk about like, how you feel about it or what the importance is of it, which again is something that you don't do in reporting. You know, you don't, you're not telling people why something is important. You're just trying to let them figure out whether it's important or not. And so the onus of like interpreting your own story was, was pretty, um, was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's sort of interesting because early in our relationship, I remember you saying, and you touched on this a little bit earlier, um, that you never really saw yourself writing a memoir, that memoir didn't necessarily appeal to you as a writer because partially um, the other characters in the story don't necessarily get their opportunity to share their side of things. You're not calling people asking for comment, right? So how has that thought process changed on your end? And how did you sort of reconcile that in your process of writing and revising this piece? So I never want to say anything bad about people in print ever, which is why I wasn't a straight news reporter. I was an events and entertainment reporter because then I just got to talk to people about the things they were really excited about. And if I didn't think something was good, I just wouldn't cover it. I tend to be a pretty sunny and optimistic and positive person. And it was really a challenge because look, there's conflict in the book. Like in this book, I'm not in a good relationship. This book involves the end sort of abruptly and traumatically of two of my very closest friendships. Um, And these aren't people who are in my life. And also, of course, it involves at the beginning getting divorced from someone. And even if those people aren't in my life anymore, I still care about them. I still, you know, I love them or I I do love them in their own way or in, you know, the sort of current way. And so it became really a challenge because they're never going to be able to reply to that, right? They will never get the chance to say, no, this is my side of the story. This is my interpretation. This is how this happened. And so it became this huge challenge because again, at first I didn't want to assign any bad actions to anyone but myself. Like I could say all the terrible things in the world about myself, but I was so reluctant to be like, and then they did this thing. And I think that thing was shitty because it's like, well, people have all sorts of different reasons for doing things. I don't totally understand why they did that. I don't want to put someone, you know, on, on blast in print. And the outcome of that is that again, in earlier drafts, these people that I did have conflicts with tended to be these like one dimensional paper dolls where I'm like, they're wonderful. They're so funny. They're so smart. They're kind. They mean the world to me, all of which are true. And then something terrible happened between us, you know? And it's like, wait, what happened? What, what was it? You know? And, and then the choice becomes, I can say, every single bad thing that happened to me was 100% because of bad decisions that I made. Or I, what I ended up doing is trying to go a more compassionate and I think accurate route of people were having a really bad time. You know, if you're in an unhealthy place in your life, like a really unhealthy place, then chances are pretty good that if you form a relationship during that time, it's not going to be a super healthy relationship. And it's maybe not going to be with someone who's also in a great place in their life. And so to me, the answer to that was to when in doubt, err on the side of tact, err on the side of discretion, err on the side of trusting my readers enough to be like, look, I can't tell you everything that happened here because it's not my story to tell, or it's too private, or it's not fair to that person. And you're just going to have to believe me when I tell you, you know, this is what I can tell you about it. And that was a challenge. Yeah. It's interesting because I noticed there are certain moments in the book where you are pulling directly from text, which Mm -hmm. I think is sort of a, (laughs) it reminds me a little bit of other reporters, this sort of possibility 
um, that you can just pull from these exchanges that you've had in your life, you know, emails and texts and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, how did revisiting those documents from this extremely difficult part of your life reveal new angles or, or um, help certain elements of self-reflection in the process of writing this book? Um, well, I'm not going to lie. Like if the question is, is writing a trauma memoir and sort of constantly <laughs> time hopping back to the worst part of your life, is that fun? The answer is no, it's not fun. Um, one of the most upsetting, I think moments personally, when I was putting the book together, um, you know, as I mentioned up top, I, I break to, or, you know, I break through my limbs in separate unrelated incidents. And one of them was I woke up in bed in just this terrible, awful, awful pain. I had no idea what was wrong with me. I went to the hospital. I couldn't tell what was wrong except that my arm hurt. And they thought that I was drug seeking because I couldn't tell them what happened. And they x-rayed my elbow and then they discharged me. And I was begging to please not be discharged from the hospital. And she was like, you need to follow up with your primary care physician. And I said, I, I need a second opinion. Something's so wrong with me. And she's like, I need you to leave. And I was like, well, what if I refuse to leave? And she's like, well, then you're going to be trespassed and the police will arrest you. And so um, at that point, like a friend was there with me. And I guess I don't really remember this very well, but like a security guard was following us out. So two days later, I went to my doctor and it turned out that my shoulder had been dislocated the entire time. And also like the top of the bone had cracked a bit. And so going back and looking at the medical records of that night and seeing what the physician's assistant wrote about me, saying that I was in no apparent distress when nobody saw me, but then when I noticed someone looking at me, I would become shrill and hysterical and cry out, I'm in enormous pain, someone needs to help me. And just how dismissive and cruel she was. That hurt, that, that was not pleasant. And again, you know, I talk about people who used to be in big, important relationships, like my biggest, most important relationships and then weren't. And so to go back and, you know, it's like any breakup, like if you go back and look at when things were good and then, you know, in the process, like you start, you see the slide downhill, you know, a, a friend of mine, unfortunately is going through a legal separation. And one thing that she had to do was go through the entire text exchange with her soon to be X, you know, and upload thousands and thousands of screenshots. And she said, you know, you, you see the decay and it's just so depressing. And so it, yeah, I mean, it, again, it was, it was difficult reporting to do, but I'm glad that I did it because again, like our own memories are so subjective and I was in crisis for a lot of this book, which means that my memory is not always the most reliable one in these cases. Um, you touch on specifically this awful moment, which, you know, I remember, you know, being your friend and living with you during that period of time and how confusing and scary it was. Um, but you also touch on the fact that memories were a little fuzzy during that period of time. And, and there are moments in the book where you have these gaps of mm -hmm. memory um, or, uh, you know, just have a discomfort with having to relive this really traumatic stuff. Um, you have this quote here um, that I think really touches on this. Um, here, dear reader, I will tell you something that perhaps I should have told you at the very beginning of this book. I don't always remember truly scary things clearly. So in the process of having to dig into this stuff, how did you start to fill in those gaps? Um, was it just, you know, pulling those documents or how did you kind of parse through those moments where things were not as easy to recall? It was pulling the documents. It was talking to people. It was, you know, going back to my own writings and notes and stuff about that time. Um, and that was, you know, and that was the best that I could do. Um, you know, in writing this. And I, like I said, I try to be really transparent with the reader. And I also, you know, note, and I think this is true and, um, you know, fair warning up front, I am not a neurologist or a memory expert or anything like that. And this is just me sort of regurgitating something I heard once that sounded right. So, you know, again, like your mileage may vary, but, you know, I, I have heard about memory that like a lot of times, like the way we recall things is like, we're recalling our recall you know, like we're not going back to like original source material in our brain. It's just sort of like those, the, the storage is sort of constantly evolving and changing. And 
I think that's certainly true in my own life, you know, and, and maybe in the lives of many humans where it's like the more I think about something, the more I begin to assign meaning to this incident or this episode within the larger context of my life, mm -hmm. the more the story that I tell myself about the story becomes, you know, sort of my emotional memory of it. Um, and I tend to also become sunnier about things in the after effects. Um, I tend to think that when bad things happen to me, it's pretty funny, which is why I was able to write this book. And in my digestion time from, wow, this is terrible to what's funny about this to this is actually quite funny, I think it's swifter than most people's. Um, I mean, I had a great turnaround time. Um, one of my very first interviews for this book on and I was so nervous and I was like so stressed, but I was like, okay, well, it's someone I know. And, you know, but it was on again, live. And the very first question is, so why did your marriage collapse? And I was like, oh, that's <laughs> right. a big question. It is early in the morning and that's a, that's a doozy. You know what I mean? But like, now it's actually kind of funny. And like, I just want to like open general conversations. Like, oh my gosh, so good to see you again. Uh, you know, I hope you've been doing well. Why'd your marriage collapse? You know what I mean? And so I like to really immediately find, you know, cause it's a good question. It's just a, a fun thing for people to be asked. Um, so because of that, you know, like I said, all I can do is I have done my very best to go back. Um, it's not, you know, it's not peer reviewed. It's <laughs> not, you know, but, but nor is, I don't think any memoir, Absolutely. you know? Yeah. Um, I actually, you touch on a little bit of something that I know, uh, again, as someone who's read your work and also someone who li has lived with you and is, is close to you, you're a very funny person. Um, oh. And I think many of us, myself included, who live with mental illness um, are able to find the humor in it because it is all, it's a survival mechanism and right. it's also kind of funny. Like we can just acknowledge that it's kind of funny when you're living it, not when you're living it, when you can reflect on it. But right. I think, you know, at, at the real crux of this book, when you're in the midst of this sort of manic depressive episode and you're very sick, um, you know, this is sort of the darkest part of the book, right? When you're diving into sort of the, the, the rock bottom sort of period. Um, and it is, kind of funny. You were talking oh. about all of these bizarre things that you were doing in this sort of manic state. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's such a fascinating choice to allow this moment that is really painful and scary, probably in the moment, to be really funny. Um, talk to me about that choice to build that sort of dip into the darkest part in such a funny way. Sure. So, um, and here's a content warning, just not, you know, not just for this book, but or for this talk with the book in general is that it does talk about like a suicide attempt and a stint in a mental hospital. And I'm going to take a really quick break before I answer your excellent question to mention the crisis line, which is 800-273-TALK, or you can text home to 741-741. And you don't have to be like immediately suicidal to do it. If you're just feeling bad, if you're feeling really bad, give them a call. Um, cause they're really, really helpful. Um, but anyway, so one of the big reasons I wanted to write this book and that I did think that this is an experience worth sharing is that what led to, you know, what had been bad mental health, what turned it into a, a major crisis was that I was put on an antidepressant, you know, mine had stopped working. And so it was like, there's this new one on the market. We're going to try it out. And it sent me into what's known as a mixed state where I was manic, uh, which was a new thing for me, but also still depressive. And, um, so therefore like having very dark thoughts, but also like being very impulsive, moving very fast, having little, you know, impulse control, um, like have an idea, act on it. Um, which is, I think what led to, uh, the events I described, but sort of before it became really bad, I, you know, say what you will about a manic state. It's a very, creatively fertile time. And I just was coming up with like all these ideas and like some of them were good and some of them were bad and like some of them were really bad and some of them were just like so fucking off the wall. Sorry about language. Um, and so what I decided to do to sort of like 
take the reader like so they could like sort of feel my ascent before this like sharp descent was to take all the ideas I had them during had during that time or at least you know the funny memorable ones and arrange them from best to worst and gave each a letter grade and like whether it would work or not um because again I'm talking about something very dark but I want I there is funniness to be had there and you know I Obviously crafts, which is, I'm so glad we haven't talked about it yet because I always have to talk about crafts first with this. And they're actually a little bit incidental to the book. But, you know, my mom pointed out that like my way of coping with mental illness is creating and that's both creating crafts, but it's also creating humor, you know, Um, and trying to like sort of take this horrible painting and see if I can retouch it or just add a, you know, giant dinosaur in the background or, you know, like just figure out how to look at this and look at it honestly, but also be able to take some of its power away, right? Because if you can laugh at something, that that neuters it. And um, and so I think that that was why I made that decision because it, the book is about a lot of horrible things that are happening to me. And again, in earlier drafts, it was just like, I don't know that anyone wants to sit here and read about one horrible thing after another. Like how much do they need to hear about what it sounds like when your bones break, literally. Um, And how do I make this something where the reader is coming with me on this journey, but able to still enjoy it? Um, Anyway, again, a very long and roundabout answer to a good question. Um, If you ask me what time it is, I will tell you how to make a clock. Right. And now I'm going to ask you about something that you just immediately addressed as something that you always talk about, but I want to address the crafts title. Um, So you use crafts in this book in a really interesting way. So there are craft tutorials. People will learn how to make origami stars, but you also approach the craft tutorials as sort of a narrative device. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you do that and why you made that choice? Sure. So one thing that crafts were really relevant to the time and so far as as you probably remember it was really one of the only things i was doing and i was really compulsively crafting like i have some of aforementioned stars in a bowl here and this is like maybe 10 percent of my output i have many more bowls of these i've given so many away interjecting today, like i lived with kelly it was in every bowl like you entered a room there are at least a few bowls of these paper stars yeah, um, it would actually make a pretty good scene to show Descent into Madness. It's just these everywhere. Um, and so, you know, I, I did tend to pair up because I, I would cycle through crafts. You know, I would really do one for a month or two months and just do it, do it, do it. And then I would be on to the next one. And so I don't, and so I synced up like what craft I was doing at the time with where I was in the book or, you know, where I was like in the story, in, in my story at that time. Um, but I think crafts are, you know, to me, the world is very large and scary and uncontrollable. And I myself a medium sized and sometimes scary and uncontrollable, but crafts are small and they, you can do them every time, you know, like once you know how to fold a lucky paper star, you're not going to F it up. You're just going to do it, you know? And it really is a very meditative thing to try to tune out like every single like thought and judgment and critique and mean thing. And all of these things that are constantly bumping around in our heads and instead just be like, okay, now it gets folded at this angle. Now I smooth it out, you know, or now this stitch goes right there and it goes in and it goes out and there's the way to do it. And if you don't do it right, you can just undo it. And you've only lost like half a second or something. So to me, crafts really were the mechanism that I had before I had like sort of more real mechanisms to, address what was going on. Absolutely. Um, I want to also address these other sort of crafts that you include in the book, Mm -hmm. which are these like brain crafts, right? So you use crafts as a sort of self-soothing technique um, throughout, but you also have other self-soothing techniques that you refer to as brain crafts. Mm -hmm. Um, How did you sort of build this arsenal of brain crafts and what is one that you have relied on quite a bit in the past? Um, so it's interesting because I, you know, 
like during the book, the events in the book and subsequent to the events of the book, I've done a lot of work. Like my life is like very, very, very different now. Thankfully, knock on wood, than it was during the book. And I'm a really different person too. Um, but a lot of that was just learning these techniques and, you know, both being taught them, whether in inpatient or intensive outpatient or just regular old therapy, but also just things that I've found. Um, one brain craft that I enjoy is um, I call, um, you know, soothing a visceral middle of the night panic, which is those times when you're up, it's the middle of the night and everything seems overwhelming. And you're like, there is so much stuff going on. I don't even, I cannot even begin to figure out how to deal with it. So I'm going to lay here and I'm just going to think about it. And so my technique is like, get up and get out of bed and get a piece of paper. We're going to write down what we're worried about. And then the big things that we can't do anything about, we're just going to cross those off the list because we cannot do anything right now or maybe ever. Um, you know, one of the best questions my therapist ever posed to me that I should pose to myself is, can you do anything about this? Should you do anything about this? So it's good to like ask those questions when you're looking at your list of concerns. For the things that you can do, you know, first pick out kind of the immediate ones and, and then like make it easy for yourself. Be like, I am so stressed because my homeowner's insurance says they're canceling me because there's moss on the garage, which means I need to call the insurance agent. I need to call a roof cleaner and, and I will even go and be on my computer and like write down the phone numbers and be like, I'm going to do that in the morning. You know, and so it's like, I'm, I'm trying to take that like crazy stressed out energy I have and be like, we're making a plan and then we're going to try to go back to sleep because now is the sleeping time and then tomorrow can be the plan and action time. And there's more steps to it, but that's a little bit of an overview. Right. Absolutely. So I know that we're going to probably head over to Q&A questions fairly soon, but I want to get into these sort of like reflecting questions. Um, one of my favorite lines in the book really early on is it's fun to smugly discuss something you think is the trunk of yourself, but is actually just a plastic bag on a spindly branch. And this is something that you say when meeting a person that ends up becoming a partner of yours for a long time. Um, what were things in the process of you living through this period of your life that you discovered ended up being mm -hmm. far more precarious than you initially thought? Well, I think, you know, as humans or I, look, I always do this thing where I'm like, as humans, it's like, no, you human, only you, like, let's talk about you human, me human. I find that like, I tend to assume that whatever mode I am in at that moment is just going to be that way forever. Like if I have stubbed my toe, my toe hurts forever. If I am happy, then I'm going to be happy forever. If I'm sad, I'm going to be sad for, you know, which is inaccurate literally 100% of the time. Like there's nothing that has lasted forever. So I think sometimes when you're in a good place, you can really just be like, wow, I really have it all together and my life is good and I am good and I, you know, and, and think that because you're doing well right now, that means that you are not still perhaps a precarious by nature person. And likewise, when it's going badly, that it will be bad forever. Um, you know, I think when I met this person, I had just made a decision that was really, really hard, but the correct one, which was to leave my marriage. And I am historically not someone who likes rocking the boat. And I had done this thing that was public and embarrassing and hurt people and I didn't like to do it, but I knew it was the right thing to do. And so instead of just sort of like going along to get along, which had been my strategy for a long time, I was, I did this thing. And then rather than think I made a good decision that was correct in my life and I need to continue to make good decisions that are correct. I thought I'm brave and can handle anything forever. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so then like, and so like, I've tried to, you know, one thing that I try to do is I try to categorize things as like right now, you know what I mean? Like right now I am in great mental health. And right now I find that I attend to the things that I need to do because, you know, I'm not in crisis, I'm not injured. I'm, you know, I have a great care system, you know, but I don't know. It's like, it's like, it's hard because we need to think that things are the trunk of ourselves. Right. But then when we discover it's not, 
like what what does that mean and and who are we now and i think the whole book is sort of a process of being like well you know maybe what i am is a fluid and moving thing you know absolutely um and it's so interesting because in this book you really get to explore your relationship with yourself during these very different periods of your life right mm-hmm. um and you know at the very beginning of the book it's pretty centered on relationships you have with other people, your friends, mm-hmm. partners and stuff like that. And then suddenly it's, you know, much more about your relationship with yourself and your mental health and your brain and sort of reflecting on, okay, who am I? What are the things about myself that I really like and want to grow? And um, how do I sort of create this life that I share with myself in a way that feels right? So I'm wondering, if, is there a way you can kind of capture the before and after within the scope of this book? And like you say, mental health is always sort of a little bit of a wave. It's, it's a continued thing. You live with it forever. You there, this is not the end of the story, but how has your relationship with yourself changed from mid 2016 to now? I mean, I think it's changed a lot. I think, um, I think of myself as a very different person now than I think I was before all of this stuff happened. I'm, I'm told by people who are close to me that I seem a little different. I seem sort of a little more settled, a little more maybe outward looking and not quite so inward looking. And, you know, I'm sure part of that is just age, but, um, you know, I would say like many people, I, I had had a tendency to define myself and my understanding of my life by my relationships with others and where I fit in. Um, and, you know, another part of what landed me in the hospital is what was accurately billed as catastrophic loss of chosen family. You know, I lost all these relationships and I was really alone. Um, and not, you know, I still had friends, I still had family, but like, I still had lots of wonderful people, but like, you know, sort of my day to day, like the people I had been seeing weren't there anymore. Um, and I think, you know, it's led to a lot of maybe sort of new pursuits. Like I, I don't think about happiness as much. And I don't think about, I want to do when I do X or when I do Y, I will be happy when this happens to me or when that happens to me, or when I have, you know, this thing that I, I think is what's standing between me and, and whatever it is, then I'll be okay. I work really, really hard on every day on just contentment just enjoying things, like enjoying my dog running around the backyard. Uh, today we invented a new startup called Eleanor's Speedy Burrito Delivery Service, which is where I throw a squeaky burrito and uh, she gets it. And meanwhile, I'm like hyping up the startup company to myself in my backyard. And I had great fun. I had a great time with just me and Eleanor, you know, or just watching the birds hop around um, and really just taking moments and being like, wow, this is really great. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I'll be honest, like all these horrible things happening to me at once kind of made me a little bit more calm about um, bad things happening in general. Uh, I was very, very fortunate during the pandemic in terms of my situation, in terms of like no small children, you know, really able to work like a lot of really good privilege there. But despite that, I think I, I did pretty well because I was used to being quarantined in my home and not being able to see anyone or go anywhere. And so that was a use valuable life experience to to take into that, you know? Um, I don't know. It's like how I like to think, and this could be wrong, but I like to think that in my life, when really bad things happen, that they do tend to make me more resilient. If I can like find the meaning in it, then it will be an addition to my life rather than something that makes me brittle or scarred or whatever. So that's, that's about, that's that. Absolutely. Um, I want to end with a question that is similar, which Mm -hmm. is about this idea of growth, right? So pretty much any story is generally centered on a character who has an opportunity to change or not. Mm -hmm. Um, You've mentioned the ways that you are more resilient and the ways that you are experiencing contentment in a new way. Mm -hmm. Um, Looking forward, what are ways that you really hope to continue to grow um, as you are sort of like 
learning to sort of live with this, you know, whether it's big or small, this like mental illness that you kind of have to hold in certain ways. Yeah. I mean, a a big part of, so I've made a lot of changes in my life. And one of them that was really, really important to me was I have really tried to get as, as involved and seeing people in my day-to-day life that live in my community, that are my neighbors. I'm really close friends with all of my neighbors now. Um, You know, I, I'm about to restart my trivia night, my in-person trivia night, which I'm really excited and, and sort of trying to get off of a life that I think I was living where it was very much just all screens. You know, it was me absorbing bad news, me with the kerfuffle of the day on Twitter or, you know, whatever it is. And just really like living through the experiences of people that I don't know that are distant and opinions and thoughts and all these things, rather than just having sort of like day-to-day in-person human experiences, which I think are much more nourishing. I think that we live in extremely lonely times of despair. Um, and then I, I think that like technology does not help us with that. So really being sure to prioritize the health of my relationships, but also not needing every any one person to be everything to me, you know, because that's a big part of why these relationships I lost were not healthy is because I was really relying on four people to be everything in my world. And that's just not, that's just not a healthy thing to do. Um, I think, and again, this is speaking from a position of privilege and having good health care. Uh, something that w- I re- learned that was very important for me, at least, is that for me, because medication is extremely critical to my health, I'm not going to say my mental health, but just my health. Um, I have a psychiatrist, someone who is sp- who specializes in this astonishingly complicated brain chemistry and really knows about how things can interact. And we, can, we, you know, we don't talk about, you know, childhood experiences or something. We talk about like how I'm feeling in the day to day. Um, I myself am much more aware of now, obviously of the met effect that the wrong medication can have. And so really just realizing that, you know, my brain illnesses or whatever are, are just with me. They're just a part of me the same way that it would be for a kidney or for diabetes or for any other sort of chronic conditions. Um, and it's, it's not a a goal or a finish line, you know, it's not like I, you know, um, John Moe who hosts a great podcast called depression mode and has written the hilarious world of depression. You know, I, I remember him, saying once, you know, like for certain people asking, you know, when are you going to go off antidepressants is like being like, well, when are you going to stop insulin? It's like, I'm not, you know, like (laughs) I like, I I would, you know, like to continue to, um, enjoy my life and thrive. Um, I think another big change is that I just, you know, I do have these tools and the most simple and annoying one, but it's, it's really the best one is just slowing down, like slow, deep breaths, like ideally like five heartbeats in pause for three heartbeats, five heartbeats out, you know, and it's, it's the most annoying suggestion anyone can give you. And it works so well and just pausing and slowing down and realizing that I do not have to weigh in on every single thing online. I do not have to, you know, like I, I can just kind of quietly be a little bit more. And, and I think that's been helpful. And also just acknowledging that, you know, my life is great right now. And guess what? It's probably going to be shitty again at some point in the future, multiple points in the future. There will be, there are terrible things awaiting me and all of us, everyone watching this terrible things are going to happen. And that is also a, a, a truth about being human is that we we've, we've just got to figure out how, what tools we can cultivate in ourselves, what contentment, what joys, what strong relationships, what community that can then carry us through those times rather than just sort of collapsing into a crumble like I did. Yes. <laughs> it's something <laughs> that um, I, I end up reminding myself of quite a bit myself, you know? Um, so Kelly, I love chatting with you always. Um, I will, it's sort of fun to do it in, with an audience. I know, <laughs> wild. I know, right? Let's so I'm on the road. <laughs> listen, I'm in, um, but I want to make sure that other people have the opportunity to ask questions 
to you. Um, I am getting a few questions in from um, YouTube. If people have questions that they want to ask Kelly, I recommend uh, throwing those questions in there in the comments um, and we will rock through them. Um, I'm going to start with a question here. Um, can you talk about the illustrations in the book, the little diagrams of cartoon figures in there? Sure. I would love to. So um, I have done I, what I would say are fairly amateurish doodles in all three of my books. Now I've always been a doodler. Um, and there's, there's a lot of really silly ones. Um, like there's one of like my uterus is a tumbleweed. Um, like, which is like how I felt after I separated at 31 and I was like, well, nobody would ever want to date a, a crone of 31. You know what I mean? And like, just assumed that like my uterus was just off in Montana. And, um, you know, there's, there's another little one of like, uh, you know, there's, there's ones of Eleanor and there's like silly graphs of, of things. And, you know, I just, I always, I found that, that was a really good way of, you know, when something was like kind of too tough of just like lightening the mood a little bit, or just like having something cheerful on the page. Um, I actually have one that's like of this extremely dark and morbid thing that remains in my house. And I'm not going to say what it is, but it was like, kind of, I made it kind of cute, even though it's this like sort of slight horror for me. So, um, I love, I love doing doodles. Um, do not expect much and you won't be disappointed quality wise. I, uh, you know, it's interesting cause it does feel like a certain element of like ownership of like the incredibly dark stuff to be able to make it something that's cute or funny or, you know, um, so here is another question. Um, what was the most challenging or rewarding craft that you worked on for this book? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, so one thing that was a challenge is, you know, uh, there are some crafts that are really important to me that as I was writing, I was like, I am not good enough at describing this. This is kind of a complicated thing. Um, I'm not going to be able to really like do it justice in print. I would say in general, YouTube videos are extremely important for crafting. Like I did my very best with diagrams and whatnot, but like there's no photos or anything. So it's definitely not a craft tutorial book. Like if you want craft tutorials, you're going to want to go elsewhere. Um, but I would say, you know, in general, the thing that I picked up that I was most happy with was embroidery. Um, because there's something like very special about embroidery. I love, I love making an embroidery like on the occasion of someone's birth or, you know, for a friend. Um, and, but in, in general, I, I think maybe the most meaningful is the little stars. And reason being is that those were what I was doing when I didn't have either of my arms. Cause this one was like in a long cast. And then this one was sort of strapped and immobilized um, to my waist. So like I, I had, I could hold things, but only if they were like right next to my belly button. So I, but I still managed to sort of, I wish I don't need everyone to see that, but I, I managed to do this craft even with no arms. Um, and that felt pretty, that felt like a triumph. So probably the stars. There are also so many of them. I, I, I feel like I, I'm shocked that there are none in this house. That feels like a mistake. Um, a little hurt, but we'll fix that next time I see you. I know, right? Um, but I want to sort of transition into questions more about sort of the emotional elements of the book um, and referring to the, our previous conversation, um, a question from Melly Mann um, is, isn't resilience an innate capacity? Does it feel like something that you gained or was it something that, you know? I work very hard on resilience. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't think people can like wish themselves into becoming a different person, but I think that there are definitely skills that we can work on. And for me, resilience is, can feel like a lot of like, sort of just redirecting my mind again and again. And, um, you know, something I talk about in the book, my grandmother's spiritual practice was Zen Buddhism and she was very faithful and very good at it, but she would never talk about it because it's not really the kind of thing that like you can explain well. And she's like, well, if you're interested, you can, you know, why don't you, why don't you look into it? You know, which is a very Zen thing to say. Um, but you know, I inherited a lot of her books. And so I, to me, like resilience is, setting aside, you know, what you can't fix in the moment and just focusing on like, what is ahead of you right now? Like, are you, are you, 
whatever you were being called upon to do, are you really focused and are you here? And resilience to me is, you know, something I work on in terms of, you know, even just like having a dialogue with myself, like, okay, I hear you're feeling really like this right now. And I hear you thinking that this is going to last forever, but like, let's talk about it. Did Hurricane Katrina last forever? Did your divorce last forever? Did the psych war last forever? You know, did the quarantine, well, the quarantine might last, we don't know, TBD. Did, did those wildfires last, you know, like things are discrete chunks of time. And to be able to acknowledge like, this is really terrible. I really hate this right now. And I can just hate it. And maybe I can figure out some self-soothing things in the moment. And then maybe later I can try to figure out what I can take from that and what is useful. And then I just have to do my very best to set the rest of it down, to set down the anger or to set down like the, why me? Why did this happen? This shouldn't have happened to me, you know, to set down that stuff because those just really aren't useful thoughts. And then sometimes I want to sprint back and like pick it up again and, and like return to these cherished thoughts of, you know, feeling self-pitying or feeling angry or whatever. But then it's just really like, okay, but like, why are you carrying all that shit around? Like, is it doing anything for you? Okay, well, let's go put it down. And then when you pick it back up again in 10 minutes, then we're going to put it down again. And we're going to do that again and again forever until I'm dead. Yeah. You know, it's, that is such a fascinating thing um, to think about like holding a negative thought, right? Because I know, you know, there is this thing that we've both talked about um, in, in our years as friends, which is this sort of element of like acknowledging that a thought might be a negative thought might be born out of a desire to protect you and, you know, being able to say, thank you. This is not necessarily helpful for me right now. I'm going to put it down. Um, as opposed to just sort of pushing, right. There is like holding and then essentially like being able to sort of put it away in certain ways. Um, I want to move on to a question from Sharon, um, who is talking about sort of this premise of trying to be fair to all parties. Mm -hmm. Um, Sharon says, but isn't a memoir just that, your version of what happened? Should a memoir try to sugarcoat a bad actor just because you don't want to hurt their feelings? Well, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I always think a little bit about, you know, in, um, in journalism law, they at least in the US, they, they definitely like make a distinction between like a public figure and a private figure. And I am a writer, but just because I am a writer doesn't mean that when people choose to have relationships with me, they're consenting to being written about. You know what I mean? Um, and these are not, these are not, you know, people who are violating the public trust or, you know, hurting the environment that we all live in or, you know, enacting injustices, these are valuable human beings. And I, I mean, I think there's a difference between sugarcoating and omission. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of things that happened that didn't go in the book. There's a lot of things that happened that like still hurt and I still really don't like, but that's for like me to figure out. That's not for the public to sort out based on my version of the event, if that makes sense. And that's, this is just my philosophy. You know, there's, there's all kinds of different memoirs. There's all sorts of different things. This is what I want my work to be. Yeah. I will. Yeah. I'll I'll also say that like, just within this specific book, um, yeah, the premise of a bad actor is sort of a tough thing when it's, you know, it's a complicated interpersonal sort of situation. Exactly. Exactly. Um, This is a question from Ellen. Um, explain your thoughts about creativity. Hmm. that's a really, that's a, what a great question. And it's really like broad too. I mean, for me, um, I feel like, you know, I do have ADHD and my brain like puts in like maybe way more RPM than are usually necessary in a given situation. Um, so I feel like creativity is just like sort of a natural thing that like springs out of that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I think I I have less of an answer on whether or not creativity is an innate characteristic or one that you can work on because I would 99.999% assume that it is one you can work on. But 
I was not a naturally resilient person. And then I sort of worked hard on becoming one, but I've always kind of been a creative person. In fact, I've always been a pretty creative person. Um, but for me, I think, you know, we think of creativity as like, I'm going to sit down and paint a painting or write a sonnet or something. And the truth is, is that creativity is about creation and it's about like just changing the world in little ways. And, you know, cooking is incredibly creative. Humor is creative. Um, you know, gardening is creative. Moving things around in your house is creative. It doesn't have to have this like sort of like super high aesthetic sensibility to be creativity creativity to me is just just those little things that you do because you're like I think the world would be a little bit nicer if it had this or if this was there and things like that and so I think you know it's a lot about joy and it's it's something that we should all enjoy and celebrate and also never just be like I'm not a creative person because what a mean thing to say and totally untrue yeah I think that that's an interesting premise to sort of go I mean it's just always a muscle right all of these things are are sort of muscles that you can work Um, I'm just plugging again that, you know, if you have any questions, if you're watching out there, um, feel free to drop them, uh, in the YouTube comments. Um, I have a few other questions I'm going to ask, um, while other ones sort of come in. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about inpatient, which is something that again, content warning, we addressed it earlier, but there, there is a period of this book where, you are in an inpatient facility. And I know a lot of people might not be familiar with what it's like outside of what they might see in a movie or TV. Um, When you were there, what was an element of your experience in that space that really surprised you just on the practical level of being there? Um, So, and again, your mileage may vary. I happened to go to what is known as Unity, which was a collaborative effort between, I think, five Portland regional hospitals. And it was pretty new when I got there. And what really surprised me is that it was uh, it was quite calm and easygoing inside. Um, But what really struck me was just the total absence of any choice. Uh, Because normally our our days are nothing but little choices, right? Like, what am I going to wear? What what am I going to do? Am I going to go here? Am I going to do that? Whereas when you're institutionalized in that way, um, everything has been decided for you ahead of time. And there is really, when none of your actions have consequences, which is sort of how it's been set up in a psychiatric ward, it's like, this is a safe place for you to stabilize and do whatever you need to do while we try to get you feeling better, you know, but once none of your actions have consequences, it's just like, I, I think I describe myself as like a sulky little cloud floating between, you know, introspection hour and trying to learn to play skip bow. Um, just because, and, and it really, um, it really made me think even more deeply than, you know, I had before about how many people we put in institutions in the US um, in all kinds and lots of which are not designed to facilitate healing. Um, And just how that is, that's an experience that unless you've, and I only had the tiniest, 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 tiniest taste, but you know, how it really makes me treasure the ability to, to make decisions and the ability to take actions that have consequences, I guess. Right. We have more follow-up questions about creativity Mm -hmm. um, from Christy. Um, Doesn't creativity come from a sense of trust and safety too? Um, I think this is interesting also just because some of the moments when you were very creative during this period that was very sort of chaotic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You were still working on books. You were still working on um, crafts and things like that. So Do you think it comes from a sense of trust and safety? Not for me, no. Um, I mean, I certainly, I do less crafting now than I do because, you know, for me, like I said, it's, it's sort of a soothing mechanism and I tend to be, um, you know, more engaged with things like, you know, being with people, you know, working very regularly, all those kinds of things. I mean, I think that's a really interesting premise from Christy, but I, to me, at least in my experience, like art often comes from a sense of discomfort and a Mm -hmm. sense of, um, you know, I mean, I think it's not, I can, I can go beyond my own experiences and say, you know, historically, maybe artists aren't always the most like cheerful, well-adjusted bunch. 
Um, I think sometimes like the need to see the world differently than as it actually as as it actually is is sort of a, a big part for me at least of creativity. Um, but I also in saying that, I do think that whatever your sense of creativity and expression is, that it should be for you and it should hopefully and ideally bring you to a place of safety and comfort, even if you don't start in one. I'm going to go on to the sort of last question that's sort of here, which is um, about the Catas- the phrase catastrophic loss of chosen family. Mm-hmm. Um, people lose family, but our relationships with friends can be just as meaningful and the loss of them can be devastating. Can you talk a little bit more about that phrase? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as I sort of went into this like very dark period, I had lost these two extremely close friendships, one of whom had been my roommate, had been living here with me. And so, you know, these were the people I ate dinner with. These were the people I you know, had holiday traditions with and, and my boyfriend as well. And, but particularly with those two female friendships, I didn't even have a word for that grief. And that grief was as big or bigger than any breakup I've been through in my life, because I had never with breakups, there's or with romantic relationships, there's always the potential, you know what I mean? You're like, this is really good right now. And it might not last forever. That's a very, but like, I had no more thought that these friendships could go away than I thought like my sisters could divorce me. It was just, It wasn't even something that I had ever really processed as a possibility. But then while I was like so abject, I didn't really have even a way to describe it. And I was ashamed. Like I didn't, what do I say? Like my friends don't like me anymore and I don't know why. And I don't know what happened and they won't tell me. Like Mm -hmm. that was, even that seemed so pathetic to me, you know, that it just compounded the misery. And then when I was, in the hospital. And I was trying to explain, you know, to a therapist what had happened, why it mattered. She said, Oh, oh, so like catastrophic loss of chosen family. And I was like, yes, that is, that, that is what happened. That describes the scope of loss that I feel right now. So I was very grateful for that person for giving words to my grief and giving validity to my grief as well. I'm wondering, do we have time for one last question? What are you thinking? Uh, I, that's it for the questions from the chat. So if you've got anything else that you are dying to ask, please, now's your, your chance to put it into the world. Yeah. I'm going to say if anyone else has any more, otherwise, I don't well, know. I, I, I will ahead. take a moment again to thank you, Zach and book passage so much for having me and Brooke, I want to thank you for not only being such a special person in my life, but these like beautiful and thoughtful questions. And everybody who asked the question, these were some really amazing questions. Um, And I would also really just like to say for anyone out there who is suffering or who is hurting, you know, um, I'm going to end with some of the best advice that I got, um, which was from one of my best friends, Allison. And um, I was talking to her about how things were better, but I still didn't really totally feel like being alive. You know what I mean? I And she's like, look, she's like, it's kind of like, you know, after a breakup, after a really bad breakup, you know, the best 30 seconds of the day are when you open your eyes and you don't remember the breakup or whatever happened. And then you remember it and then everything is terrible. And she's like, and you hate everything. And you're like, I don't want to get out of bed because getting out of bed means getting up into a world where this has happened and you just walk down the hall and you're like, I hate this paint color. I hate that picture of me because that me was happy. I hate my toothbrush. I hate my teeth. I hate the Crest Corporation. I hate everything. And she's like, and you don't feel like brushing your teeth. And she's like, but you got to brush your teeth anyway, because presumably someday you will not be in this world anymore. And in that world, you will want to have your teeth, you know, and some days it's just, getting up and trudging through. And that is a not small part of the human experience. And if that's where you are, I'm so sorry. I I hope that things, you know, change soon. I hope that you can access whatever it is to get you to a happy place. Um, But in the meantime, just keep trudging and keep brushing your teeth because it's not going to be this forever. Nothing is ever forever. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this whole conversation and for this book. Um, and for those words of advice, and I think this is such a 
a subject that's so important to people and still some so much stigma around talking about it. So thank you so much for for writing this and for sharing your experience and your story and Brooke for being here as well and, and doing this. This is really like a special hour. Uh, and I want to remind thank everyone you. to buy this book and to buy it from Book Passage. And we have signed from the book place. Passage. Very important to get it from Book Passage, but it's also Absolutely. just important to get the book. Um, and if you buy it from Book Passage, we have signed book plates. So you'll be able to get a signed copy. So absolutely do that if you're interested and we hope you do. Um, and thank you both so much for being here again. Um, it's really lovely and really special.